May. These webinars are designed to give you a unique inside perspective of the diverse programs, people, priorities, and partnerships within the Penn State College of Agricultural Sciences. We are recording this session and we'll be sharing it via email with all who registered. You can also find links to all past sessions and registration information for future events on our college website by searching College Connections. Today's session is on utility scale solar energy considerations and impacts. And I'm delighted to be joined by Tom Murphy, who's the director of the Penn State Marcellus Center for Outreach and Research. Our discussion will focus on utility scale solar development in Pennsylvania with topics such as landowner issues, legislative initiatives, and how organizations are collaborating to inform stakeholders about this rapidly expanding energy production type. Utility scale solar is such a large topic that we won't be covering such applications as homeowner use of solar panels. After the presentations, we will have a Q&A session, first addressing those questions that were submitted during the registration. If you have questions during the presentations, please enter them at the Q&A link, not the chat, as it is easier for us to track them there. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Tom Murphy. Tom has 38 years of experience working with public officials, researchers, industry, government agencies, and landowners during his tenure at Penn State Extension. His, his work is set, centered on educational consultation and energy transitions, specifically at the conversions of shale gas and renewables, with a more recent emphasis on utility scale solar in his role as director of the Marcellus Center for Outreach and, Outreach and Research called MCOR. Tom provides re leadership to a wide range of Penn State's energy outreach events and research activities. So over to you, Tom. All right, Rick, thank you. And thank you to everybody for the opportunity to be in front of you this afternoon, talk about solar. We're finding there's lots and lots of interest on utility scale solar as it's uh, starting to develop and emerge more broadly across Pennsylvania. And we're gonna talk about a variety of issues as they would relate to it uh, from the landowner's perspective, also touch a little bit about uh, from municipal officials and elected officials, some of the places that they're entering into the story and some of the places that even as landowners and communities of people that, that we're all interacting together on this topic. Rick, I'm gonna to jump to my slides. Um, I'm gonna do a uh, screen share here real quick. Okay, can you see my slides okay? All right, thank you. And the other thing that we're gonna do at the uh, tail end of my slides and we'll contain them to a limited amount of time is we're also gonna take a short virtual reality tour or immersive type tour to, to take a look at the Nittany One facility, which is down in Franklin County. So we'll talk about some of the issues here and then we're gonna jump and actually have a, have a chance to stand, so to speak, in the midst of it in a virtual sort of fashion and take a look around and, and better understand what some of these facilities look like. Um, as Rick said, today we're gonna to concentrate on the, the conversation that's really about the utility scale side. We're not gonna delve into the uh, residential, which would be more of a rooftop type setting. And there's, we're just trying to contain the discussion here. Uh, but there's also a discussion going on across Pennsylvania about community scale. So if rooftop is just that, it's what you would have a few panels that might be on the top of your roof or a commercial type setting. Community solar is something that's typically defined as under about five megawatts. So we're looking at something that might be 25, 30 acres, something in that regard. States around Pennsylvania, several of them anyway, have uh, community solar programs, but here in Pennsylvania, that's not allowed by, um, by uh, regulation within the state, although there's legislation to change that in Harrisburg uh, right now. So we'll have to see how that sorts out. So we're gonna go to grid scale and grid scale is gonna be the larger uh, type of solar development that's occurring here. Typically it's, it's something over five megawatts. And typically on an acreage basis, we're looking at something that's 100 acres, several hundred acres, and in some locations, even here in Pennsylvania, it could be several thousand acres. So much bigger type of uh, uh, story that way. Uh, we think about solar as it's occurring here in the state. We often get asked the question, why here, why now? Uh, we <laughs> like to talk about the fact that there's a variety of drivers that are really moving this forward, and, and we'll talk about a number of them. Uh, but the reality is we see about 500 of these projects currently in the PJMQ or the Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland queue. Uh, that is the power grid that if you're here in Pennsylvania that you're uh, in and you get your power from, unless you're producing yourself, of course. 
And that would be that actually one of the largest uh, utility grids here in the United States, and it's here in the, the east uh, coast, the mid-Atlantic states, that include Pennsylvania. It does not include New York, but it does include a number of states uh, east of us and south and west of us. Something to consider when we're talking about, and the question, you know, why here, why now, is Pennsylvania's large uh, energy generator. So there's a lot of infrastructure that's here. Uh, we export a lot of power out of the state, and because we have so much uh, infrastructure in place, as some of that infrastructure is making a transition right now as we go through a larger national and global energy transition from some of the fossil generation to some of the, the newer renewables or clean power, uh, that infrastructure is in some cases being reused or is certainly a, a targeted opportunity for some of the new energy companies that are looking at utility scale solar development. So that would be one driver. Uh, we also know that there's a big market component there. So there's policy, there's market, there's infrastructure, there's a variety of reasons why utility scale solar is moving forward across the country, but certainly why it's moving forward here in Pennsylvania. From a policy standpoint at the state level, uh, we are seeing that there's a drive towards acquiring a certain percentage of our power by the year 2030. Uh, if you do the math on that, that looks like it could be at about somewhere to, in the vicinity of about 80,000 acres of surface area that could transition here within the state by the year 2030, if not before. Uh, my gut says that it likely could be more than that. And again, we're talking about surface acres, so this could be rooftop. It could be over parking lots on top of stadium roofs. It could be uh, certainly in some of the open land that we have, brownfield sites, landfill, uh, abandoned landfills or landfills that have been uh, completed. So just a wide variety of different places or different surface types that, that could host some of the solar. We also recognize that this is a big infusion of money within the, in the state. Some of that will go into workforce, some of that will go into indirect and induced uh, economic uh, components, meaning the money that's spent within communities around where this is developing, and a variety of other ways that that money could be showing up here within the state. But again, the number there gives you some kind of an idea. We're also central to a lot of markets, certainly the, the bigger uh, Eastern metro markets. And we also want to highlight the fact, again, when we're explaining why here, why now, that there's new storage technologies out there. You often hear about lithium battery storage, but there's other types of storage that's, that's finding its way into the commercial viability space or sphere. Uh, green uh, hydrogen, for instance, could be one of those and, and one that's finding its place in Europe, for instance, and is starting to show some possibilities here within, within uh, the U.S. So declining costs are gonna be a big part of this. I'll highlight that here with this graphic. You see that the price of installed uh, solar is going down. We have seen a slight, and these are some projections going forward, uh, but we have seen a slight uptick. And we're also looking at it in cost actually, uh, due to a variety of things, but we're also watching a federal uh, investigation right now that might lead to some higher tariffs potentially and could either stop some projects on a national basis, certainly here within Pennsylvania, um, uh, or other types of considerations that might come out of that same investigation. So tariffs or increased tariff costs could be part of that, uh, different sourcing of panels or, or where they might uh, be coming from either here within the country or internationally could be a part of that outcome, but definitely something that we, that we wanna be watching going forward as we try and understand and answer the question, why here, why now, and what's over the horizon as well. I think it's important for us to also consider about uh, where we've been getting our power as we think about the solar and where we might be getting it going forward, but where have we been getting it? And, and here with this graphic real quick, you look at power generation here within the state, you can see the blue there, that's coal, and that uh, the first graphic there in, in 2007, you can see a very uh, significant amount of our power generation in, in uh, 2007 was coming from coal and a very uh, small piece that was coming from renewables and just slightly bigger than that that was coming from natural gas. Well, that's at a time that, that the gas story, the Marcellus story is really kicking into gear in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania at that time was number 10 in terms of natural gas production. Pennsylvania is now number two in the country and number one in terms of shale gas production. So that really changed the dynamic in there and power generation certainly followed that as well. So if you jump to the next uh, side, uh, side of, of the slide there, you see in 2019, much more gas in the story, much less coal in the story. Uh, so lots of arguments for and against that, uh, certainly. 
Uh, the green being nuclear is relatively stable through that time frame anyway. It's changed a little since then. Uh, but as the coal has gone offline, that's made more of that uh, power generation infrastructure available. Um, some of those uh, existing plants, coal plants uh, going offline, they have connection hubs into the grid and certainly solar companies are looking at that as, as opportunity as well. So that's 2019. And if you uh, just jump back there real quick, if you're looking to see the renewable side, it went from 1% to 2%, not a big increase. But in 2019, things really started to change in terms of projects, utility scale or grid scale, same thing, uh, solar projects that went into the queue here in Pennsylvania. You can see a big uptick. So we went from a few projects to now there's uh, most recent count 501 projects that are in the queue here, the utility scale projects that are in the queue here in Pennsylvania. So a lot more projects, a lot more activity that's occurring that way. Um, and that's something certainly for us to think about in a, a wide variety of different considerations. And certainly um, it will be manifested in a number of the questions that we're gonna be answering later. What's that mean for land use or farmland uh, considerations? What's that mean for repurposing some of the grid or expanding the grid? What's that mean for new right-of-ways? What's that mean for this change in, in um, uh, where we source our power from and what that might mean in, in a whole host of different ways going forward, including new industries coming in, uh, which we had not necessarily seen in the past. So that, that's gonna be a big change and something that we definitely wanna look at. Uh, we also see a, a large uh, matching uptick in the amount of interest for people leasing their land. So many companies are now approaching landowners across Pennsylvania and about leasing their land for solar development. Uh, the state is looking, uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is looking to source 50% of its power from uh, renewable resources, mainly solar, going forward. Uh, Penn State is now sourcing almost 25% of its power needs, electrical power needs coming from solar. And that's going to be part of the tour that we're going to do at the end of this um, conversation. So again, you, you know, a number of changes here that we need to be thinking about. Uh, but I think this graphic helps us to understand that uh, certainly as, as we think about this in a larger way across the Commonwealth. So where are the project? Where are these projects that have been proposed? And one thing that I'll, I'll mention, you know, 501 projects is a lot of new projects. Industry uses a metric of somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the projects that are actually proposed to go into the grid are actually uh, constructed. So that's a big difference over the number of projects that are actually proposed uh, between that and what actually is constructed. So projects are going to be put into the into the uh, queue. Projects are going to fall out of the queue, and new projects are going to be added in. So where that's going to uh, sort out in the end is still to be seen. Uh, FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which has some has certainly jurisdiction with the grid as well, as part of that conversation, and there's a dialogue now between PJM and FERC to sort out and make that uh, process more efficient and to allow for an easier pathway to sort out these projects and bring more uh, into the queue and, and, and uh, through the queue and, and into the grid and actually into people's power into people's homes. But this graphic gives you an idea, some information that we uh, source out from DEP, a partner in this process. You can see where these, these projects are around the state. Uh, it's interesting to note as you get down into the southeastern corner of the state and see there's fewer projects. Well, think uh, more people. So greater uh, population density, higher land values, uh, smaller parcels of land to build projects like this. Uh, infrastructure um, issues down there as well. Just a wide variety of, of issues why you would see uh, less proposed development down in that area and certainly cost and cost structure is going to be a big part of that. More rural parts, more open parts of Pennsylvania, I mean, more open land as we think about that southern tier, uh, south central part of Pennsylvania. And then you look up in the northwestern part and, and some uh, drivers, similar drivers in that part of the state as well. So we're trying to get a better understanding of that and certainly as we educate the many publics that we're working with uh, across the state. I threw in a real quick graphic from a colleague up at Cornell, shows a similar type of trend. You look at across uh, New York State, for instance, you go down into the more populated areas down in, in the Long Island, certainly down and around New York City or up near Albany. Uh, you can see very few projects that are being proposed. So the closer you are to a lot of people, actually where the energy needs are the highest, you see less projects and you see them in more rural areas. And I know there's some questions we'll entertain about that as well. Uh, we also have a graphic, again, uh, from uh, some work that DEP has done. 
And what does this look like if you uh, scale this out and if you use a, a metric here of six acres per megawatt? So if you look at the net number of megawatts that are proposed in these projects, multiply that by uh, six, six acres per megawatt in terms of what the technology can potentially produce, you get an idea of the number of, of acres that would be uh, needed or are in the queue in the proposals uh, right now across Pennsylvania. So what acreage could potentially be tied up? And again, this is uh, acreage in total, so it's surface area in total. Although right now, about 82% of the projects that are in the queue, uh, they're being proposed on what's referred to as open land. So a lot of that is gonna be ag land, although it's not all ag land. Uh, and it's not, uh, there's some, there some breakdowns. We go into forested land, which is a, a single digit number. Uh, brownfield sites, which are uh, previously industrial type sites, they're waiting for other types of activity. Uh, Reindustrialization, we'll say, uh, those are in, the, in that as well. But the reality is about 82% are, are, like I said, are in uh, open land. So where does this typically show up? And it'll go to some of the questions we'll get uh, into later, but typically where companies are looking uh, to source uh, locations or to site locations or where there is infrastructure uh, nearby. So going back to some of the earlier comments I made about why here and why in these locations. If there are high voltage um, power lines nearby, if there are substations in close proximity, that's what companies are looking for at this point. Close proximity, define that. That's not 10 miles, might not even be five miles with a lot of uh, companies and proposals are making. Typically it's single digits, typically it's one to three miles. So if you were interested in leasing land or if you had concerns about uh, this type of development near you, you know, either or, or something in between, uh, these would be some of the things that you'd wanna be looking for of could it potentially show up here versus showing up somewhere else. Um, we would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about leasing, some of the work that we had certainly done on the shale side, a lot of experience that we gained there that we're bringing into the solar side. Uh, so with some conversation back and forth with Rick, we thought that would be important to embed in here as we certainly think about a lot of landowners, including some I'm sure that are on the phone and, and many that approach us and some of the work that we're doing in that regard that are interested in, in setting up a lease potentially if there's interest uh, from an energy company or energy companies in their, in their, um, in their location. Uh, typically what we find is anybody that has a location that would be suitable uh, typically is approached by uh, more than one company. So they have to sort out the different leases they get. So they really need to understand the terms and conditions, the payment terms that, that might be in there, uh, different timelines, just a variety of different things along those lines. We always uh, suggest as our first point of advice, hire an attorney and hire an attorney that understands this type of lease agreement. Uh, there are unfortunately few a number across the state, but there are a number of them. So we would encourage you to interview a number of attorneys to find uh, the one that would be most helpful in that regard, uh, not necessarily just the one that you might be using or the first one that you might call. And there's quite a difference in pricing as well. Typically, there's three different agreements that might show up. If you're involved in the leasing, first would be a letter of intent just to test the waters with you. Uh, the second one that shows some seriousness is an option agreement. So an option agreement, similar to other types of real estate agreements, uh, they're trying, the company is trying to tie up the land and take the land off the market while they do their due diligence. So that's going to have, it's going to be a couple pages in length, might have a map in there to show the parcel. It'll have some other deed book uh, identifiers and things of that nature. But it'll talk about timelines and typically that uh, option agreements, one to three years, something of that nature, could be longer than that. It'll have terms, they'll make payment. In there and typically they, they might pay uh, the landowner uh, a couple thousand dollars. I've seen one to five thousand dollars, but it's one to five thousand dollars per year in total, not per acre, but in total for the duration of that option. The lease is the big thing, and most option agreements, as they're written, are going to have a lease that underlies them. So it's important uh, for the landowner to understand all the terms that are in the lease. And there's a lot of legalese in there. So again, it's very important to, to in, in our opinion, to make sure that you hire an attorney uh, because that long list of terms to consider in there uh, could be impactful for many generations uh, on that particular land holding. And many of those land holdings are certainly farms. So we wanna be thinking about this from a multi-generational standpoint. 
There's timelines in there. Uh, there's certainly the financials. Then payments are being made on a per acre per year basis. So if somebody were to get into one of these and the uh, uh, lease is exercised from the option, uh, they can be pretty lucrative depending upon the amount of uh, acres that are that are tied up. I already mentioned it was multi-generational and, and these leases can have an extension clause in them. So the first um, uh, term might be 25 years, but then they could be extended out in five-year increments or, or in like term. So if it's 25-year lease, it might also be extended then in another 25 years. Where are they cited? And just uh, meeting these uh, locations, just a quick list, I'm not gonna go into great detail. PowerPoint will be uh, available and certainly you're welcome to circle back with us if you're interested in getting into it in a lot more depth. Uh, but typically they're looking at what the amount of land that's available, they're looking at slope, they're looking at uh, avoiding certain surface conditions like wetlands and floodplains. Uh, they're looking, is there a farmland preservation already on the farm? If there is, and the, the property wouldn't be available. Uh, soils, uh, looking at avoiding some things in terms of um, um, uh, rocky areas like karst topography, if there's a uh, surface uh, expression of uh, the limestone, so they're going to want to stay away from things like that. Uh, it's also important to think about some of the other uh, access points uh, by the company. Are they going to be accessing the land uh, through the farmstead or are they coming in from a back corner someplace? Uh, what's going to be inside the fence? And I'll, I'll make an illustration of that in the virtual tour that I'm going to show you in just a moment. Uh, so what's going to be in the fence and what's going to be outside the fence? Meaning, is the solar facility going to be fence row to fence row, or is it only going to take a portion of the farm or the land holding? And what we see often is the option talks about the entire property, but the lease eventually, if it is exercised, is only a portion of, of the property. So what about the rest of it? Uh, is, that, is the company going to pay for that? Are they going to pay for some kind of rent or is it going to be available to the landowner to be able to uh, still utilize for whatever purposes they do, whether to farm it or recreational use or whatever it might be. We also think about agrivoltaics. I mean, heck, this is College of Ag. So we want to be thinking about agrivoltaics and can we be uh, farming of some type inside? Uh, right now, that's uh, largely defined as grazing. And that grazing is largely defined as uh, sheep grazing. Uh, goats tend to like to climb on panels. That's a problem. Uh, bigger animals like cattle or horses, uh, the panels are raised. They're going to rub on the posts. So if, uh, you know that that can be a problem. Uh, tear up the wires, and you know all those things can be problematic. And sheep don't cause that that problem. We are seeing in some cases that uh, co the companies are looking at uh, ways and working with a landowner or farmer in particular to do a more conventional type of agriculture under these uh, rays or between the rows. And we're seeing more of that work being done in Europe that is now starting to find its way uh, here into the US and, and a lot more research, including at Penn State, that's working on some of that as well. So the farmer or the landowner wants to make sure that they keep that right of first refusal to be able to go in and do that work, either from a maintenance standpoint or to be able to do agrivoltaics in there as well. We'll also have another quick list and these lease agreements, typically the lease agreement, although the option agreement is just a couple pages, the lease agreement can be 40 to 60 pages. So there's a lot of terms and some of the, some of the components in there could be insurance and hold harmless agreements, you know, indemnification, taxes, who's going to pay the taxes. Uh, when you put these arrays in, will that increase the taxes if that's the case? What about clean and green? Uh, who's going to pay? How's that going to work? Can the farm be re-enrolled uh, back in the clean and green if it falls out when these go in? Uh, the answer is yes for most of those, but again, there's a variety of considerations there. And also I mentioned about uh, roads and, and about uh, power storage options. Um, and then lastly, just another a real quick list here, crop damage. I've seen leases already that only talk about crop damage for one year, uh, but there could be crop damage that, that could be there for multiple years. So again, uh, we want to think about that in negotiating. Uh, what about rights that might already be in place, like hunting rights on the parcel or OGMs or oil, and gas, and mineral rights? Uh, can solar be done where these other rights are in place? And the answer is uh, yes, possibly. Uh, it just depends. It depends how they're written. It depends what the company's uh, intentions are. I mentioned about other uh, existing land restrictions. You have uh, CREP programs, uh, other federal uh, programs, federal land programs, farmland preservation. We've been working with We Conserve PA here in Pennsylvania along those lines as well. Uh, screening is a, a big issue and something you want to think about as, as landowners if you're into the leasing side. 
or something we have a lot of conversations with county commissioners, county planning boards, and certainly with municipal officials uh, for screening these facilities, either from roadways or other people nearby. And then lastly, the point that I'll make is about decommissioning. Decommissioning is a uh, very hot topic here within, within Pennsylvania. Uh, there is a uh, piece of legislation that is uh, working its way to the House, possibly to the governor to sign if it makes it that far, on uh, decommissioned aspects of decommissioning, in particular with bonding. So is there a bond put in place? Um, we're talking about a very expensive type of development, as I mentioned before. You're looking at one to $1.13 million per six acres when these panels are put in. So to decommission or take them away obviously can uh, be a very big cost as well. So is there a bond put in place, a performance bond? Uh, if there is, who holds it? Is that something that needs to be in the lease? Is it something that's held at the municipal level? Uh, is it a place that the county gets involved or is there, or is there a, a state level um, uh, effort in place? And there is in many states. And again, we're, we're uh, heading that way potentially here in Pennsylvania. So bonding is going to be important uh, to be able to uh, guarantee that uh, these type of facilities would be removed in the future, assuming that they would be. Uh, they could be repurposed, they could be repowered with new technology, you know, newer solar technology at that point, or again, repurposed for something else. So it'll just depend uh, what happens, but there should be a performance bond in place and that guarantee needs to certainly start by uh, being in the lease. And the last thing that I'll mention, um, and then I'm going to jump to the tour here real quick, uh, Rick, is we've been uh, doing a number of solar leasing programs. I've just mentioned, you know, a number of what I would call key points or high level points. Uh, but we've brought several attorneys in and uh, some work that we've been doing, a, a series that we did with uh, Cornell and Farm Bureaus here in Pennsylvania and, and in New York State, a lot of commonality between what's occurring in New York and Pennsylvania, although they have community solar and we don't hear within Pennsylvania, but a lot of commonality when you consider the terms and conditions in the lease. Um, so we've done some joint programs. We're gearing up to do an, another one. Uh, so stay tuned if you're interested in that. It'll be over four different weeks in July and August, uh, starting, I believe, on July the 9th, but we'll have that uh, information available. Uh, and the websites there are recordings of the ones that we did uh, most recently. Again, using two different attorneys, breaking down a lease, looking at some of the conditions in there and giving some uh, more detailed understanding and then actual lease uh, terms to embed in the lease or consider if you're uh, thinking through a lease right now. And then lastly, we have other solar webinars we, that we've been doing for municipal officials, county officials, uh, broader public with you know, many different uh, uh, questions or concerns or conversations around uh, the technology and what this means on the landscape. So you can see some of the other, if you go to the last webinar uh, series there or the, um, the website there, you can see some of the ones we have in that regard. So with that, uh, uh, Rick, we're not gonna go to questions quite yet, but I am going to jump out of this. I'm gonna jump to the uh, tour that I was gonna give. Oh, no, I'm gonna jump back out of there. Just give me one second. Remember to share the screen. All right, so Rick tells me that I can see it and I'm just gonna back up here real quick. So what this is, is uh, this is Nittany One. I mentioned that Penn State gets uh, drives 25% of our power generation needs uh, system-wide from uh, solar and that's coming from Nittany One, Two and Three which are all located down in Franklin County. There's eight of these large utility scale projects here within the state at the moment. I mentioned a number of 500, there's 500 of them in the queue, there's eight of them on the ground. Four of them are in Franklin County, three of those are the ones that um, are aligned with the Penn State initiative at this point. So this is Nittany One, uh, it's near Shippensburg. This gives you some kind of an idea. This is, I'm just gonna take a few minutes to do the tour and then we're gonna, we're gonna move to questions. But this gives you some kind of an idea what these actually look like if you were if you were standing there. Um, this is about 175 acres. It pretty much in this case is fence row to fence row, which is somewhat unusual. This was shot in September of 19. This was shot using 360 technology. So it's not a video. I'm just kind of spinning it around to give you some kind of an idea. All the permitting has been done by the time you're seeing what you're seeing here. Uh, the grid has been laid out with the racking system that's going to hold the panels in, up, up in the air and, and uh, be able to produce. 
You have some a very early part of the, uh, the workforce that's here and they got to the point where there were several hundred people that were here working. Uh, but you can see how, how it's laid out here uh, on this field. And you can see the, the vegetative cover that was there before they actually started. I'm gonna jump uh, forward and this is December of the same year. So shot from roughly the same area, uh, uh, pretty close, but you can see you know, the racking, uh, a lot more of the racking is put up. You can see the posts that are being driven over there. You see some of the transformers and inverters are in place. It also gives you a chance to see as you uh, kind of, as I spin around here, some things are underground. So we talk about that decommissioning. We wanna think about, well, what's gonna come off of the surface, but what's actually uh, buried on the site that might actually have to come off the site as well and how deep would it be? So some of the cabling has been trenched, some piping is put in to hold the cabling. Cables would typically be pulled out, the panels and the racking system would be pulled out. That would all be part of the decommissioning and the bonding. But this is, um, this is December of 19. I'll go through these real quick. The technology here, this is tracking technology. So this is single axis tracking. Uh, it's gonna move with the sun from east to west over the day and then reset by an algorithm that's, that's there. Uh, it's relatively quiet, but it's gonna move over the course of the day. And then, like I said, reset. It's monofacial, so what hits the surface is where the sunlight is captured and the, the power generation uh, is captured. Uh, that's about 25% efficient. There's also bifacial panels and what's reflected from the surface underneath can also be captured and add a couple percentage uh, to the, um, the power uh, generation as well. So again, this gives you some kind of an idea uh, several months later. If I jump even a little further ahead, this is uh, May of 2020. Um, you can see some of the, the drill marks and some of the roads that are there. So we think about stormwater management from a, uh, you know, what actually leaves the site. Panels are impervious, but uh, you know, how are we handling stormwater? And that's different from location to location. Uh, roads, you can see have been uh, redone and, and re-graveled, but again, you get an idea of what this looks like. And then this is uh, 2021, June of 2021. So it'd be uh, last year, almost a, a year ago. Uh, get an idea again, some of those roads are now up in, um, up in green. The site is being grazed. Actually, the, this is June, but uh, by August, they were actually grazing the site. So there's sheep that are running in here. Uh, some farmers that are actually uh, adjacent to it are, are doing, uh, doing that same grazing. And the last one that I'll show here, and this is up in uh, New York State, and then I'll show just a couple of real quick insert pictures. Uh, these are two community solars. So they're smaller in nature. You can see the front to the back there. You can see the fencing, a little closer shot. But you can also see vegetation type. So this that's on the left, uh, the shepherd is actually the, the uh, woman in the mauve shirt there. But you can see the vegetation type is different, more legumes on that uh, location. So that's something that was put in the lease. They designed it that way. Now, where is the site ever here that was not set up that way? So a landscaper is coming in and they're running mowers and weed eaters and things of that nature. Um, and then lastly, um, oh, back up real quick. This is uh, three quick shots. This is a, some drone footage. This is up in uh, New York State. Give you an idea, uh, looking down so you can see acreage that I mentioned before about what's inside the fence, what's not. Gives you some perspective that way. Different shot, same facility. You can get an idea of what that looks like. You can also see the area in the middle and what that is is battery storage. So again, we wanna think about uh, things down the road. If you're a supervisor or a county commissioner or planning commission official, you think about noise ordinances, you might think about light that might be in there, dark sky type uh, considerations. Uh, if you're a landowner, you wanna think about, uh, you know, are these on the property line, where are they gonna be located? Uh, will I have access to that site? Will it block me from using other acreage? All those are things that need to be considered that way. And then that real quick shot of the, um, uh, the battery storage and some of the other equipment that's there. Okay, Rick, with that, I think I'm on the time that we talked about. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing. I'm going to move back to you and we'll move to questions. Rick, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Um, one of the first questions, and you've touched on it, least, is what are the characteristics to make a property viable for utility scale solar? What's the minimum amount of land? So we've we've talked about slope, not rocky. How much land at a minimum would they be interested in? So with these, these utility, and that's why I talked about community versus utility, um, there are companies that are leasing in Pennsylvania right now for community scale. 
So it's not permitted in the state, but there are companies with their due diligence period and their option agreement, they're looking out several years, assuming that it'll actually take place. So to your question, if somebody is being approached with a lease, it might be a, being approached for something that might be 20 or 30 acres uh, because the company is thinking about community and the landowner should be asking that question. What type is this? Uh, but when you talk about utility, most projects are in the hundreds of acres and they're getting bigger. So you're typically talking about hundreds to thousands, a couple thousand acres. If you go out in the Midwest, you're talking about projects that are 10,000 acres. Not sure we'll see them here in the state, but a couple thousand acres is already on the books. Okay. Um, what's the long-term impact from the loss of nature, I guess, uh, ecological services and agricultural lands to solar projects versus the actual renewable energy produced? Well, the reality is that when you're talking about these projects, and that's why I introduced the concept of agrivoltaics in there, uh, companies are looking to uh, use this land, uh, what's under the panels or around the panels for some sort of a uh, purpose other than just mowing. And I showed you the example up in New York State, for instance, you know, some are doing it one way and some are doing it the other. So getting language in the lease to uh, suit the landowner in that regard is going to be very important. The landowner is using it for hunting purposes or for rural recreation or other types of enjoyment of nature, then they want to make sure that they're embedding that in their lease. If they're a farm operation and they might have a, a farm um, opportunity there, a farming opportunity, then they want to make sure that they're embedding that or at least getting the right of first refusal. Maybe they, they don't want to do it anymore and they just want to retire. Uh, but if they want to be able to use it for agriculture, then they want to uh, put those terms again right in the lease. So that's going to be important. One of the questions that was raised about that was nature. And just thinking about it, one might imagine on that scale, you wouldn't have trees there, but the nature that might be low growing shrubs, which suggests to me things like butterfly habitat, pollinator habitat. Mm -hmm. Have people been looking at that sort of thing as part of natural ecosystem services? Yeah, the, the pollinator part, I, I was actually at a, a, a very good um, seminar earlier this week at the, at the Penn Stater and somebody from Earth Seed was talking about their Fuzz and Buzz, you know, a company that uh, some of you certainly know and some of you may not, but a company that operates here in Pennsylvania, a um, uh, big Penn State supporter, and uh, they've been doing a lot of work and looking at uh, pollinator crops and other types of seed mixes that could be beneficial underneath these panels and or around the panels. So pollinators are a part of that, but other types of considerations from a nature standpoint as well. So conservation mixes or other types of um, you know, grazing mixers uh, that could be used have, have a dual purpose and has hence the uh, fuzz and buzz uh, type uh, scenario. That sounds great. Yeah. So um, what specifically is Penn State doing to reach out to farmers concerning industrial scale solar? Mm -hmm. So, um, I, again, I referenced some of the work that we've been doing from a leasing standpoint. Uh, we've done a number of those working in conjunction with Farm Bureau, We Conserve PA, uh, the Conservation Districts, uh, DEP, some farm groups in particular. Uh, we, we did a program with, um, with Grange, for instance. So a, a variety of ways that we're trying to approach the farming community or the ag community and then communities uh, in and around there. So, you know, there's certainly lots of different stakeholders in this uh, uh, land transition conversation as, it, as it's occurring. And we're trying to make sure that we're providing very extensive outreach and ongoing outreach as new people uh, enter into the conversation or come up with a series of questions. It will never be a once and done, just like we learned with the shale dialogue. Uh, new people will be approached and as they uh, as they are approached they're going to know these answers and we're trying to offer ongoing uh, uh, seminars in that regard some in person and some on web are what kind of steps are being taken uh, to make sure that women underrepresented groups small-scale farmers are uh, given this kind of advice it's much like the challenge we have all across extension it is. I mean, the, when you look at the, the uh, groups that we have, uh, if you were to break down the demographics of the, the groups that we have or the stakeholders that we have come out to our sessions, I would say we have more women that are participating in our in our workshops uh, than men. Uh, but the reality is we're inclusive and we're, we're uh, bringing information and providing information uh, to everybody that has an interest in doing it through a variety of different platforms. Again, some in person, uh, some by phone, some by Zoom, and, and certainly a role in, a, in the webinar presentations we're making. So another concern is recognizing um, property uh, rights. How can you intelligently zone utility scale solar in order to preserve working lands for farms and forests? Is the one to three miles away from the high voltage grid enough to preserve a lot of land, for example? 
Well, this is one of the, the this is a, a very um, uh, vibrant question here in the state of Pennsylvania as it is in many other places. And a place that we're actually working on some research and we've just proposed some research for the Center of Rural Pennsylvania looking at this very question. But some of our colleagues and some of the peer inst institutes around us are also working with us and working individually on, on some of these same points. Um, there's a number of different good examples of, of how to do that. We're working with um, uh, zoning officers and planning commissions in uh, individual townships, as well as with uh, counties that are then trying to influence the townships that might be under their umbrella. I had two of those conversations even here today with different uh, uh, counties. So trying to put ordinances in place that have a recognition of class one, two, and three farmland and how to protect them, how to preserve, uh, how to also find a place in the system, or we'll say in the, within that jurisdiction, whatever it might be, county or township, uh, to allow for solar development because uh, by uh, Pennsylvania code, that would be, the, that would be necessary. Uh, but to look within their jurisdictions and where, to, to Rick, to your point, where is this development uh, potential uh, located? Meaning you might want to put, it might want to allow for solar development, um, you know, over in the northeast corner of a, of a township, for instance. But if there's no infrastructure there, then there will never, ever be any development there. So it's kind of a moot point. So those are all things that we're having as part of that discussion. And again, we're working very extensively around the state and continue to do that. Uh, with these outreach sessions that we're having for those type of officials. CCAP, PSATs, uh, municipal, uh, borough officials, uh, all, all through those different groups. And we'll, again, as I said, we'll continue to do that. So part of the philosophical side of this is, uh, should agricultural land be used for this industrial use? Or what about brownfields? Can we, can we keep most of these onto places that are not ideal farmland or is there, is there enough to go around? This is always going to be a, a point of tension. And, you know, I often, when I think about that question, I also wear the hat myself of a farm owner, and I'm also a planning commission chairman in our individual township. So, you know, I'm trying to think about this point from a variety of different standpoints. Um, I have a concern. I'm trained as an agronomist. And as I said, I live on a farm. So I'm concerned that we preserve ag land, farmland for its uh, best intended purpose which typically, or we like to think is agriculture. But that said, we see a lot of land converted to subdivision for homes. And we see a lot of big uh, warehouse, commercial warehouses being built. We see a lot of other uh, types of development. And, and sometimes we don't hear that same concern about that type of transition that's occurring, uh, but we do hear it with SAR. I think it's important for us to look at this on a larger perspective and how much land are we seeing transition uh, for all types and what is the impact or one of the impacts of that here with agriculture in Pennsylvania. To your point about brownfield, we hear that question a lot. Why not just brownfield sites? Why not old strip mines, et cetera, et cetera? It goes to the other point that you made, Rick, and that's about uh, infrastructure. If the infrastructure, high voltage lines, uh, substations and such are nowhere near that, uh, uh, those brownfield sites, those old, old coal mines that might be you know, 10 miles back in the woods, it's not going to get built there because the cost to build the infrastructure is so high, company is going to look for a different location. So that's one of the big uh, stumbling blocks. But if, if you remember, I said about the coal plants, uh, as more of those go offline, that creates more opportunities uh, possibly to reuse some of that infrastructure uh, and potentially draw in some of this uh, utility scale solar in those locations. It's not as simple as I'm making in that regard, but uh, that is a, a a big part of the dialogue, and we do see uh, solar companies that are that are leaning that way when they can. Right. So, water authorities often look at vast areas of land as water protection areas. What are what are the impacts of these solar farms for that? Are we getting enough impermeability? There's a lot of runoff issues, or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so, there's a number of questions that are probably in there. We've worked with several large water companies that have large uh, open land surrounding them that have an interest in actually putting utility scale solar in, assuming they have infrastructure nearby. Uh, they typically go, and it's part of maybe one of the questions you didn't ask directly, but it's embedded in there indirectly. What about um, not just runoff in terms of water runoff, which certainly the uh, water company would be concerned that any water that runs off is gonna stay within the watershed, it's gonna stay within, you know, be able to be collected and, and used. But what about uh, things that might, uh, chemicals and such that might, from an environmental standpoint, that might slough off the panels? Get that question a lot. 
Uh, older technology had some heavy metals in it, newer technology, it's a very different type of technology and, and uh, that's not so much the case. So we recommend baseline testing of, of soil and water uh, in close proximity to where the panels might be to establish baseline before the panels go in. But again, it's a very different technology than what had been used in the past. So that the, uh, those type of problems are not anticipated. From a stormwater management standpoint, um, in, a, in a broader sort of fashion, I answered a similar question this morning with a county planner that's looking at that. Um, they're looking at if you have 70% cover, if you have four inches or more of grass height or vegetative height, if you have a slope under 8%, and I see other beyond just this particular county, but other uh, counties and townships doing the same thing, then they're looking at the panels as being um, impervious, so to speak, or pervious, I'm sorry, that yeah. they would be pervious. Obviously, the, the panels that everybody recognizes, they're impervious. Uh, but the reality is, if the water is going to uh, fall off the panels or slide off the panels and, and uh, go in, uh, infiltrate the grass, under the conditions that I just said, and it's not going to run off the site, then stormwater management impoundments or uh, structures are not necessarily uh, as critical and or uh, may even not be necessary. Other townships and counties look at it very different. They say everything, uh, all surfaces, all panels are impervious and all water then would have to be uh, um, monitored or um, uh, engineered into a structure. And we see other scenarios in between. So that's the range of what we're seeing at this point. Right. Um, when does the signing a solar option affect your ability to sell the property? Should a life event occur, such as entering a nursing home and so forth? It, how does that work on a practical basis? Well, on a practical basis, the, the nursing home comment aside, I, I know where they're driving to. We're really talking about estate planning, and actually, we're going to do a, a session of, uh, related to that uh, here in August. Um, we're talking about potentially uh, life changing amounts of money here. So, once that happens, that's the second part of your question. Once that happens, then you need to be thinking about how to manage that money over the course of time. No different than the shale story. We saw a lot of situations along those lines. Some people did real well. Uh, some people within a short period of time were out of money, even though they started with a lot of money. I think the statistic is uh, two years after somebody wins a million dollars in the lottery, 50% of them are bank bankrupt. Uh, this may not be so different than that. And again, we saw examples of that in the shale story. Uh, the first part of your question was, uh, now I forget it, I'm sorry. I mean, just basically, how does it affect the ability to sell oh, selling it? Yes. Um, any type of a of a uh, easement or right away or placement of something on the property and a lease of that that extends for a period of time is going to convey with the property. So if the property is sold, then that's going to convey or the right to be able to use that is going to convey with the property as well. Just like any other thing that uh, could be there, if you put a power line in or a gas well or you know, many other types of, types of things that could be done. So another question was, what does the science say about the leaching of heavy metals from the panels? Well, I addressed that to some degree just a moment ago when I talked about the, the watershed or the, you know, the water companies. Uh, the science is, I think, pretty clear on the older style panels that there were some instances where they were finding some heavy metals because they were used uh, in a, a configuration in a way that the, uh, the panel could allow that to uh, leach away or you know, through some breakdown of the panel itself. Any metals that are used other than the racking system and the, um, the frame around the panels that are being used now, which are aluminum, uh, anything else is embedded in the glass. Uh, that can, those metals, uh, and it could be you know, ranged from silver to copper to a variety of other things, certainly the silicon itself, all those or most of that can be extracted from the panels when they go through the recycling project uh, process, assuming that they do and don't go to a landfill. Uh, and right now, what I understand, uh, the math shows that a, a ton of panels, a ton of panels is worth about $550 at current numbers. And the, the number seems to be through a, a physical, um, chemical and a thermal processing of panels, you can remove all but uh, about 10 to 15 percent of the materials and recycle them. It's the rest that would have to be uh, potentially landfilled. And uh, that's another place for science, including some at Penn State, that's working to solve that last component. So turning some of the questions in the Q&A, 
<clears throat> how can how can um, you address the loss of farm land and so forth with the emerging needs for good candidates of research op options to consider incorporating classes in the research these aspects of solar and so forth so how can how can uh, some of these research projects be incorporated into what emerging needs would be what emerging needs would be good candidates for learning and research options for faculty okay so if we look at good good question so if we look at nitney one uh, that's a uh, living lab of sorts and i went through that really quick i have a lot of other pictures there that show some of the work that's being done uh, in terms of different types of uh, herbicide treatments to burn down and then uh, revegetate different types of seed treatments. So what works best underneath the panels? So as we think about, you know, making recommendations across the state, uh, Audubon Society is looking at things along the same lines from a wildlife standpoint, you know, obviously in particular with birds, but some other considerations there. Uh, we've done a little bit of work with um, Dickinson College, for instance, and some of their grazing programs under one of the arrays that they have. And we've seen the same thing up at Cornell and, and also up at uh, UMass. So, and they're working on a big agrivoltaics effort right now at uh, Rutgers. So the reality is that there's a lot of uh, peer institutions around Pennsylvania, as well as what we're doing here within the state uh, to try to get a better handle on this as we move from, remember I said eight of these within the state, uh, moving towards some part of 500 going forward. So we want to get this right, and we want to get it right here in the beginning before these are out there and established. So it sounds like there are a wide range of uh, questions to be asked and ample opportunity for uh, researchers at every level to get involved in them. In yeah, and in partnerships too, Rick. Uh, there was quite a bit of research money from um, the National uh, Renewable Energy Lab and some other labs, you know, national basis. Uh, even from some of the companies who are trying to, you know, get a better handle on some of these, uh, some of these things, and even groups like here in Pennsylvania Center for Rural Pennsylvania, uh, and other entities like that that are that are trying to work on this and and uh, fill in more of the gaps that are out there. I think we've covered a lot of the gaps, but there are still places that we're surfacing, questions that we're surfacing, and and places that we think that we need to get uh, some some uh, more definitive answers and even some clearer answers as this gets further along here within the state and nearby. So the next one's a really tough one, it really calling on a life cycle analysis of solar compared to alternative energy sources. So the question is, if you can include all the courses, costs, pardon me, of manufacturing solar and disposing all the materials when it's decommissioned, how does it compare with gas and nuclear power in terms of environmental impact? Has anybody been so brave as to try to answer that one yet? Well, um, <clears throat> I don't, I think the answer is, that there's not a full answer to that question. I mean, there's other considerations and I'll just I'll lay out a couple of them. I saw a good graphic even the other day where they looked at power density, for instance. So what is the uh, amount of acreage necessary to site a, um, a, a natural gas plant? And the reverse from an energy uh, uh, production standpoint, and obviously it's a whole lot less acres than it would be for something like solar. But then you have to go further upstream and you have to look at the number of pads and pipeline and and all those sort of things and some of the other costs that you mentioned as well. So there is there there are some comparisons that are being made, but to do the whole life cycle analysis where you start looking at uh, tax credits that are that are issued by the federal and state government, uh, other types of investment considerations that are out there and then uh, the lifespan of these projects and the fact that we're using technology that uh, continues to improve meaning what the technology was that we used five years ago, what it is right now, where it's heading potentially in the, in the next couple of years could make a vastly different uh, outcome to, to, the, to the question that you're asking. Keep in mind, I said that the power generation is coming from most of these panels right now, the efficiency is about 25%. Well, let's say for argument's sake that you had stacked panels and there's some, um, some uh, dialogue about that with some new materials, some translucent materials that could be stacked one right over the other. Uh, the side of buildings that could be utilized, you know, some of these type of things, it can make a really big difference. But if you move from 25% to 30% to maybe 40%, um, you can see that that would make a big difference in the outcome of your question as well. So it's an evolving story. It is. Um, what's the stat, a few questions asked about this. What's the status of legislation on community solar? How can we help convince the legislature to pass the legislation? Well, you know, I should have said in the beginning, and I did not say, but I'll say right now uh, as a quick disclaimer, I'm not advocating for solar. We didn't advocate for gas. What we're trying to do is educate in that space. So um, I'm not going to advocate here in that regard as well. 
Um, that said, um, this is it's a legislative uh, moment. Uh, there are, there's uh, people that are advocating for it and, and arguing for it, lobbying for it, and people that are uh, certainly lobbying against it. Some of the big utilities that might not uh, see as much humor to it. So uh, this is something that uh, you know, if somebody's interested in lobbying for it, they might look at how it passed in some of the surrounding states and the effort that went forth to make that happen, and and that probably would be a, um, a course of action here within the state. Right. Um, one question was about larger animal like deer being pushed off the land. I, I suspect that deer, could, if they can hop the fence, would still be grazing around some of these sites. But the the eight foot fences that we're seeing going around most of these, wow. I've yet to see deer inside them. Um, so some of these ground that they could graze. Some of these have uh, livestock type fences, high tensile wire uh, livestock fences, which. I've seen enough uh, apple orchards that have a six foot high uh, livestock fence around them to have deer inside. So, uh, you know, deer can learn to go through that. So that's the inside defense question. Uh, outside defense, if there was a concern there, and I've raised that in some cases, when these get big enough, these arrays get big enough, it concentrates the deer, and in this case, just talking about deer, concentrates them to the edges. Uh, that can be impactful uh, to farm fields that might be in close proximity to that edge. So that is a consideration and uh, was just having that discussion with the county planner this morning because they were thinking about um, wildlife corridors and how you could deal with some of those issues as well. It's not been resolved. If I get back to your prior question, if there was a place for research, there is a good one. All right. Um, you referred to class one, two, three farmland. Could you describe or define the differences? The differences, it, it's a production differences, a production difference between one versus the other. So your most productive would be uh, one in that case, and something that would be less productive would be three. So you could measure that against the crop that's being produced. You measure that against um, uh, drainage considerations and a variety of other, uh, you know, topsoil and, and, and largely productivity uh, type uh, aspects of that. There's classes that are after that. So they would be more, more poorly drained, more marginal type soil. So in a kind of a high level way, uh, that would be the distinction you're making between them. And most of the ordinance language we're seeing is uh, looking at uh, protecting those class one, two, and three soils and looking at the more marginal soils as a preferred location for panel, uh, panels to be placed. That doesn't mean that that is where they're actually going to be uh, developed or deployed, but uh, that is a direction that's trying to be uh, given in the uh, dialogue itself in the ordinance language. Um, are there any particularly unusual tax issues, property tax issues that are emerging from this? Well, clean and green, and I, I touched on clean and green before. Um, clean and green is something that uh, should panels be placed on a property and they had clean and green uh, tax abatement uh, that was in place, then the property likely would fall out of clean and green. Uh, so the landowner would want to make sure that the any tax increase and any penalty, because there could be a seven year look back and penalty there. So all that should be covered by the company. Any increase in taxes going forward should be covered by the company. So that needs to be negotiated in the lease. Uh, we are also seeing that a lot of the um, uh, land that's being considered for panel deployment is being considered in places where the, um, where um, uh, taxes might be, land taxes might be lower. So could that raise, uh, could there be new assessments that are done and certainly locations where assessment hasn't been done for potentially decades of time. Uh, could that change the, the, the land tax structure, the real estate tax structure and the uh, county real estate tax assessor, assessor association here in Pennsylvania is doing a real hard look at that right now. And I know they've made some uh, suggestions to CCAP, but we'll have to see where that sorts out going forward. Ooh, well, Tom, you covered an enormous amount of stuff today, the number of questions and information. So a big thank you from all of us. Welcome. Um, so to our audience, before you log off, um, please note the next session listed on your screen. Um, it's June on research and automa automation robotics and agriculture. I'll be jo joined by Dr. Long. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Agriculture and Biological Engineering. And I'm looking forward to seeing that um, see and seeing you next month. And Tom, Thanks again. That was fantastic. Great job. Thank you. Thanks, Rick.